a series of educational events exploring what's happening with Fukushima and the exponentially increasing radioactivity in our oceans and biosphere and what we can do about it. We intend to continue these events exploring this issue with other scientists and analysts in the coming months. And we're all here because we love the ocean and our exquisitely beautiful biosphere. And we want to protect it, as I know all of you do. And we are so pleased and honored to be in conversation tonight with two eminent scientists who are, against all odds, uh, doing precious work amassing data necessary to gauge and indicate what might be happening as a result of the radioactivity released and continuing to be released, not only from Fukushima, but from elsewhere. And so the truth is, um, we are being very balanced here. We have one scientist who's attacked by the pro-nuclear people, and we have one scientist who's attacked by the anti-nuclear people. So we're, we're giving a very balanced account. <laughs> right. So the, the truth is that we need all the measurements we can get and all the studies. Yet the governments and agencies are not providing funding to the scientists nor information to the people. Now why is that? Who can imagine? Um, <clears throat> so we need these scientific markers because we don't want to be either overly alarmed or overly complacent and neither panicked nor dismissive. And uh, this is a reality. We've got a constant buildup of radioactivity going on here. So is, this so is the ocean safe for our children to surf in? Um, is the seafood safe to eat? And what can we do to help the people in Japan? And what can the people in Japan do to protect themselves? And what can we do here? So we're so happy to be able to have this conversation tonight with these brilliant men and all of you here. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce <clears throat> Dr. Bessler, who is a senior scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He is currently director of the new Center for Marine and Environmental Radioactivity at the Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institute. And you can get more information at his Cafe Thorium website. So thank you so much, Ken, for being here. Thank you for that introduction, and Bing, and everyone for putting this on, and all of you for coming here tonight, because it really, your interest is what motivated me to step back as my research science uh, makes me you know, study these kinds of things and talk to people about what it all means to have a little cesium, a lot of cesium in the ocean. What does that mean for us and for you? And it's your interest that brought me here today from uh, Woods Hole is outside of Boston. We're independent, we're not for profit. About 800 people work there. It's quite a large place and we exist on mostly government grants or private foundation funding. But the story I want to tell, and we'll hopefully have time for a lot of questions, is going to start with a little history what did it look like near Japan before Fukushima? That's what that image is supposed to show you. What happened in 2011 in March at the events of Fukushima Daiichi? That's an aerial photograph of some of the explosions at those reactors. Uh, where would that nuclear material, those contaminants be moving with the ocean currents? How quickly would they reach our shoreline? Uh, that led to this crowdfunded campaign ourradioactiveocean.org, where people like Bing got their friends and groups together to help sample, help me sample and analyze, pay for those analyses. And then I'll end with something that's kind of new for me, is making it easier so everybody could wear something to actually collect samples, get more data, because I'm very much a scientist who wants to see what the numbers are. So, what are the numbers? So we're going to go back in time to 1960, 
59 to 61. And just to remind you, in the ocean at Scripps Pier, this is La Jolla near San Diego, people were already monitoring the levels of cesium-137, a byproduct of the atmospheric nuclear testing that was going on, starting you know, with World War II and beyond. And these are the levels going up and down, very, actually very frequent measurements. I'm a little jealous when I see how many numbers they have. And forget the units, uh, but we'll remember this number eight because I'll be using that unit later on to show you how much is off your coast. But back in the 60s, we had levels that went up to eight of these becquerels per cubic meter, so eight. We're measuring there now in 2014, seeing numbers around two. So our coastline, specifically the west coast, has seen higher levels back in the 60s than what we're detecting today from the additional cesium coming from Japan or what's in the ocean as residual from that time. So every time you go in the ocean, you're already swimming in waters that have some of those isotopes in them. How big was the testing compared to, say, Chernobyl and Fukushima? And I'll talk mostly about cesium-137. I'll tell you more about other isotopes later. But 1,000 petabecquerels, that's a number with 10 to the 15 zeros. That's a very big number. It's a very small unit. It's like measuring distance in millimeters instead of miles. But it is about 1,000 of those units were released for cesium in the 19, primarily 50s and 60s. Most of it's in the ocean because we live on an ocean planet. Chernobyl was about 10 times smaller. Most of that fell on land. This was 1986, some 25 years before Fukushima. We have more uncertainty in the Fukushima numbers because we didn't have very good measurements. A lot of the radioactivity drifted over the ocean. That's good news for Japan, but much harder to analyze what's there. So we have numbers that range typically smaller than the total from Chernobyl. I tell people it's comparable. As an oceanographer, what strikes me is more of it went directly into the ocean itself. And so for the oceans, this was unprecedented. As an accidental release, this is much larger than Chernobyl for the oceans. Uh, by the way, Three Mile Island was a very, very small in comparison. OK. I'll just do very quickly kind of reminding you what happened. We all saw the pictures, the devastation of the tsunami uh, that caused the power outage that led to the overheating and then explosions at Fukushima Daiichi on the coastline. The first thing we saw were those explosions coming off, gases coming out, volatile, so things when they get hot become vaporized, put into the atmosphere, and that's what we call fallout. About 80% of that fell into the ocean. Thankfully, it didn't blow mostly to Tokyo. Uh, the highest levels on land are kind of in the north and in the west, but most of it fell in the ocean. And that would have been shortly after, a few days after the overheating in mid-March. They also uh, took heroic efforts to keep these reactors cool so that it didn't get any worse. And they did that by putting water on these reactors and trying to cool them down. Even though they shut down the fission process itself in the reactors, there's still a lot of heat left behind from all the radioactive materials. And that requires cooling water whether you're producing electricity or not. And we call that this direct discharge. That actually peaked a little bit later, and I'll show you some data in the next slide. But basically, you're putting water on a reactor, buildings that's becoming more contaminated, that water as it seeps through them and goes back in the ocean because you're right on the coast. Now, fallout, some of it did land on land, and that comes back down through rivers. A very small amount uh, compared to what was put in the ocean then, but it continues to this day, and scientists in Japan and others are monitoring that. And then work that I do as well uh, is groundwater flow. So we're taking samples on the beaches north and south and looking at what's coming down underneath the ground as a groundwater input, which is also a continuous source of these isotopes back to the ocean. So as an oceanographer, these are the four things I care about. So I've got a couple of graphs. This one, I think, is quite informative, and so I'll, I'll walk you through it. Every red dot is an ocean sample. Someone went out, grabbed some ocean water, as close as they could get to Fukushima Daiichi, basically the docks, the water's right next to those reactors. And this is 2011 in April. 
This was March 11th. They started sampling a couple weeks after these units. It's this Becquerel, it's this decay event per second in a cubic meter of water. A cubic meter of water is 260 gallons. It's a very small unit, a big amount of water. The number that they were seeing off Japan, and actually here today, I'll give you a little bit of an idea already, it's about one or two of those units. The numbers I saw coming out of Japan started at 10,000, went up to 50 million by April 6th. The highest we'd ever seen after Chernobyl were about 1,000. So this is when we were getting worried. This is when we were flying down to Washington, D.C., saying we've got to do something. These levels for marine biota, if you're swimming or living in those, can cause mortality, reproductive effects, things that were easy to see. And these levels actually could be reduced quite quickly by basically plugging holes in all of those buildings. They had basements that actually, if you remember some of the images, had what looked like a, a fire hose of, of radioactive water just going into the ocean. So if you start plugging your big leaks, this should go down, that's the blue line. It should go down back to here quite quickly unless you have continued releases. And so from the start, as soon as we saw here in June, which is the first time I went over there, levels that were elevated, we knew there was an ongoing source as well. Let's put these a little bit in perspective, and one reason why there's some confusion is they have an operating limit of about 60 to 70,000 becquerels per cubic meter, well above any countries that's our US drinking water limit, 7,400. And so by some standards, these waters were, uh, this is the one word I don't like to use, I'll say it now, safe. They were considered okay because we got below the reactor limits. Abe, the prime minister, is saying everything's under control, it's not leaking. Well, it was leaking, it still is. The number today, I'm going back in a few weeks, will be somewhere between 100 and 1,000. And at these levels, there's still a concern for seafood. Consuming and internalizing cesium is a much greater health hazard than just swimming in the ocean with a little bit of cesium in it like we all do all the time. So I'll show you some fish data, but this is how bad things got, and that's when we really knew we had to be there. Never seen anything like it. So I think I'm going to repeat that. When we're in the tens of millions, I'm going to be directly worried about impacts on the marine biota. Thousands, tens of thousands, I'm going to be concerned about eating that seafood. And down in here, I'm not as concerned. That's similar to what we see today already in the ocean for these isotopes. So at those levels in 2011, they measured cesium. Now this is total cesium in fish that same Becquerel unit per kilogram, two pounds of fish. And they measured it over time, and this is again when they were saying they had stopped the leaks, it's under control. They had already, though, closed down these fisheries along the coast of Japan. Fukushima Daiichi is down there in the red area. And the numbers were not going down. The only way you can have fish remain high in cesium is to keep introducing cesium into the ocean. And so it's kind of interesting what I've shown you so far, these red dots, these are all Japanese data. But what we did, what I did, was took some of those numbers and put them in some sort of a usable form. Someone asked me over dinner tonight, you know, were the Japanese allowed to say these things? I don't know people who lost their jobs, but they were told not to publish information like this. This data came to me from a colleague in Japan who could not be co-author on the paper. He worked for the fisheries department. and. He provided these information so I could put it in a form like this to say, look, the numbers, half of them were above this limit of 100 that Japan had set by 2012. And it was good reason to keep those fisheries closed. And to this day, several of the fisheries are closed, even though this has gotten much, much better. And I'll show some numbers later to see how low it is today. But clearly, ongoing sources. Again, every red dot is a fish sample now, not a water sample, and lots of variations from 10 of these units up to 10,000, and I'll show some higher numbers later. So that's Japan. So what does the ocean do? Some beautiful things, actually. This is a model from satellite data made by NASA of ocean currents. And all of these white lines show you the direction and velocity of water moving off Japan with the Kurashio current. I live on the East Coast. We have the Gulf Stream. This is the Gulf Stream of the Pacific, and it moves water very quickly out into the ocean. So anything you put in the ocean here 
debris, other things are going to move with these currents. So what you can also do is model the isotopes of cesium. These move with those currents and predict how far they're going to get, how fast, and how much is going to be in the ocean. So you do this kind of model. That would pretty quickly. That's one year. It would have made it about halfway across the Pacific. Here's Hawaii, by the way. Most of the isotopes are carried with currents north of Hawaii. They started out in the red here in these tens of thousands. Already, they're much lower, 10 to 100. Late 2013 is when we started a lot of phone calls. Uh, I would look at this data and say, well, the numbers here are quite low, but there were no numbers being collected in 2013. And again, low on this scale of in those waters, it's safe to be there. In tens of thousands, you don't eat the fish. And in the millions, there's direct impacts. 2014, 2015, we expect to see some sign of it up and down the coast. But this is a prediction based upon a model that really takes the entire 5,000 miles and does some very basic assumptions. You know, all models, it's been said, are wrong. Some are useful. This was very useful for us, but it's not the real world. It's a model. So we'll let it go on, and you'll see the numbers are going down. But basically, we were sitting there at the end of 2013. I had only worked near Japan. I hadn't thought about the west coast of North America. A lot of people were concerned. We wanted to address that concern and collect samples, and that's how we started this OurRadioactiveOcean.org. That's the motivation behind this citizen scientists, because people actually collect the samples for us, and crowdfunded, because we need about $550 for every sample to measure cesium at these extremely low levels. You can't wave a Geiger counter over it and quickly analyze. You need the specific techniques that we were doing back in Chernobyl, back before then, to look at the residual amount that was already in the ocean. So we introduced this, and we'll hear maybe a little bit more about it from Bing, but we can propose locations. You can view those results. As soon as we get them, we put them up. The fun part for me, I'll go through a couple of pictures, and I'll show you what that map is. But you know, we get people involved. This is right here at Point Reyes, some of our first sample collectors. There's a five-gallon container that we have to fill up to analyze it. Here's another example of a surfing group in Santa Cruz that got together and had a fundraiser as part of a local radio station. You know, I, I'm a research scientist. I usually do these things myself on very expensive equipment with machines. These people just got out there, made an event out of it, uh, tried to learn something about how the ocean works in their area. Uh, classroom here, uh, La Colinas Junior High School in Santa Barbara took a sample for us. Again, a pretty big sample, but relatively easy to do. So that's been happening now, everywhere from San Diego up to Alaska, Bering Sea and out in Hawaii. I'm plotting now by color, white is, or yellow is the location of all of these samples. We've been very successful. We have about 60 sites now and 100 samples in this year and a half of existence. Uh, we have most of the citizen sampling for us along the shore and a couple of research cruises where we collected water and then used that crowdfunding support to actually analyze them. Yellow is where we've seen 134 cesium. I've talked mostly about the one that's still here from the weapons testing era. <coughs> cesium-137 has what's called a 30-year half-life. It sticks around for decades before it decays away. Another radioactive form of cesium has a two-year half-life. And the only place you could find that would be from something recent like Fukushima. And the levels, you probably can't read that number. It says very low. It's less than two of these becquerels. That number we saw off scripts was two. Fortunately, what we've seen, and this is a very new number down here off San Diego, a couple of times up here in British Columbia, one that's so new I got on the plane somewhere off of uh, 50 miles off of Seattle, we found another dot that's about two of these units. We're starting to see the, the penetration of cesium from offshore. These are all offshore samples to these coastal sites but at levels that agree with those light blue colors on the model, something like two in these units. We did one comparison. I'm not going to say uh, this is zero. You know, We can always detect small amounts of 
uh, cesium-137 in every single sample, so that's what we swim in. But if you get up to numbers like 10, uh, we're talking about an amount that the risk from swimming is something like every day in an ocean at 10 would be a thousand times less than the single dental x-ray you choose to take. It's not zero, but it's not what concerns me when it was 10 million off Japan or 10,000 when the fisheries were closed. These are the numbers we're seeing. We have a couple numbers from Point Reyes and Bodega Head here in the last month. All of them showed less than 0 0.2 for the 134 cesium, and uh, so we can't detect it. And very low amounts, about two, one and a half to two of the 137. That's what we've seen all along, even before Fukushima. I also want to point out that we're not the only ones doing this. This is from a Canadian lab. They had some cruises offshore. This is back to 137 cesium, but this number here is five. I mentioned 10 because we've kind of doubled the highest number we've measured offshore. And we see it primarily offshore, a little bit of mixing here, near shore. That's some of our data. Same kind of map. One thing, just in case people have followed some of the news about odd temperatures in the ocean, there is an anomaly. There's warm water. This is temperature over here, the same part of the coastline, trying to line it up. And what we see is that there's warm water offshore that's not mixing into the cold water near shore. And that's probably what's kind of the same physical processes, these ocean currents are keeping the cesium-137 and 134 offshore. So these are consistent with each other and coming from completely different data sets than what I just showed you. Cesium offshore and ocean currents that are maintaining anomalously warm waters offshore. It's been called the blob if you've been following some of the news, but little mixing. Uh, kelp watch, some of you even participate, I heard today, in, in kelp watch. They have sites at the locations here the colors just indicate which year they sampled. I believe they don't see any of the 134 cesium in their samples at this point. Uh, they have 48 sites and about 52 scientists using kelp as a way to integrate the signal. It's like a sponge, right? So you can go back and look at the kelp. Uh, so on our coastline, I haven't showed you any fish data. So I just want to contrast the cesium and fish near Japan, these three bars here. The bottom dwelling fish are what I showed you before, near 100 of these becquerels. Salmon and tuna have always been lower. We think it's because of exposure on the seafloor to higher levels. When those tuna, for example, swim to San Diego in 2011, we saw for the first time 134, the isotope from Fukushima at about 10 or 12 in all of those tuna, not in 2008. But the gray bar you probably can't see is there's always some cesium in everything that swims in the ocean, 137, that legacy cesium at levels of a few of these units. So whether we're talking about tuna or salmon, we're talking about levels that are even there today for things that feed off Japan and swim across. Japan has the world's strictest limit for the amount that's allowed in seafood that made them close the fisheries here. Our limit is 1,200. <laughs> 10 times higher. When I first went to Japan, the Japanese limit would have been up here at 500. They lowered it because they wanted to increase public confidence in seafood safety. It wasn't based upon new data. It was based upon the idea that lower is better. I think people might agree. But there wasn't new data to support that. And, and they eat easily twice as much fish as we do. So 500 made relatively good sense. But to this day, they're sticking with 100, and most of their fish are falling below that if you look out in 2014 and 15. In Canada, oh, there are headlines, though, right at the power plant. The highest number I've seen is 7,600. You probably don't want to eat that. It's kind of an ugly-looking fish anyway. Uh, but so within the arms of this reactor, where there still is an ongoing leak, you do find some hot spots, and that's been the real dilemma is when can you open up fisheries when you find unique fish that are that high. And by the way, they set limits so that you would have to be eating above that limit every day to receive a dose that the health officials consider significant. One fish usually doesn't cause something that can be observed uh, in human consumers anyway at all. But you have to set limits, and that's what they've done. Noose River, so these are salmon and steelhead trout 
uh, from a group called Inform in Canada, and they've been analyzing these last couple of years. This is 2014 data, the most recent I could get, the amount of cesium in fish along our coastline. People ask me, why don't I analyze fish? Well, that's not something I'm trained to do. I could do it, but if we don't see it in the water, I don't expect to see it in the local fish populations. Some of these salmon do migrate. They're using a color scheme here, so if it's green on the top, like they all are, there's less than one of the units of 137 cesium, that's an ebby fish, and if it's blue on their belly, which they all are, they're not yet detecting any of the 134 in salmon up and down British Columbia from Victoria, Canada, up the coastline. So these are data. Uh, we've heard a lot in the news about trying to link health effects in marine biota. Starfish wasting is one of the ones that got the most press. Uh, people immediately started to make links between what might be happening and it's certainly of concern. There have been since then uh, virus that have been identified as being the major cause of the wasting disease and mortality, not something that we can attribute to radioactivity per se. There have been beached mammals, whales. This is an example of April of this year. They went out and analyzed for cesium and couldn't detect the 134 isotope in them. So I think. My opinion, I'm not a radioecologist, I measure what's in the water, but the levels in the water are too low to cause something that you could measure directly in terms of our side of the ocean, not what was happening in Japan. But it's also very difficult, as we'll probably hear from Tim, to link cause and effect with multiple stressors. We have climate change stressors, we have plastics, we have other pollutants, things causing stress on these animals. But we don't see anything in the water that would make me alarmed about our coast and if we did, it would be much worse on the Japanese coast, and they're also not observing in the ocean uh, massive die-offs, for example, of starfish. So I think we have some hope there. I'm getting near the end. I've talked about a lot of things, but mostly about cesium. So why just cesium? There's a whole alphabet soup of isotopes, some of which are much more dangerous to us. Uh, we're focusing a lot of strontium-90. So what I tried to do for this talk, forget the units, uh, 2011, the amount of some of these isotopes was much higher than cesium. These are the ones that decay quite quickly, so they have larger health effects as they decay. That's the process that would cause a health effect. Iodine-131, eight-day half-life, causes health effects because of accumulation, in particularly children's thyroids. But it's gone by 2015. The only ones left, krypton is a gas that disperses quite wildly, well, wildly, <laughs> widely. Cesium isotopes that we've been talking about, strontium-90, 30-year half-life, that I believe is of more concern these days. It's a logarithmic scale, a million times smaller amounts of plutonium, which is of concern, but nothing, in fact, that is higher than what was there already from those weapons testing. This was not a large source of plutonium, despite some reports to the contrary. That's based upon Japanese data, my data, and understanding what physically happened. The core remained intact. It's water going through the core, gases and things getting out that were the main source. That's consistent with these data here. So it's not just cesium, but if we don't see cesium, we don't expect to see these other isotopes. So ending here, you know, this was unprecedented for the ocean. The impacts will always be greater, closer to the source. That sounds obvious, but I think people forget that. Anything we attribute as an effect here should be much worse in Japan. And certainly, as we'll hear, the effects are starting to be seen on land much easier. It will cross the Pacific, but I think the levels will be not zero, but similar to what we saw in the 1960s uh, during weapons testing. And what do I lose sleep over? Uh, the continued ongoing leaks are a growing concern for strontium-90, something that is retained longer in fish bones and our bones because it substitutes for calcium, something that's in your system. And I keep saying, you know, you can't just measure those tens of thousands of fish. You have to look at the oceans, the rivers, the biota, come up with new ways. And certainly the decommissioning, the costs, safety costs, the decades, and those poor 100,000 plus people who can't remove, move back to their homes is a huge loss in Japan, culturally, financially, uh, closed fisheries in a country like that. Uh, finally, you know, I still believe we need more data, so we're trying to work on ways to make it easier to collect a sample. So instead of asking you to get 50 pounds, five gallons of water, we've got this cute new device. 
Uh, it's, it's working. Uh, it's going to be working and tested on something that's also phenomenal uh, attempt that will be made by a person named Ben LeCompte. I almost hung up on him, but I read that he actually has swam across the Atlantic, and the way you do these types of swims is you go in your wetsuit eight hours a day, get on your support boat, it's called a stage swim, go back in the water. He did that for almost three months. It's gonna take him six months in his wetsuit with a much larger support ship to get 5,000 miles from Tokyo to San Francisco, and he's gonna be wearing this device and collecting samples, not just for radioactivity, but for plastic. So it's a platform. He really wants to just teach people about oceans and what's going on. And we're looking right now for sponsors, both for those samples that'll be on our website, Our Radioactive Ocean, and really to bring this from this one 3D printer version to uh, the masses so people could wear this up and down the coastline. Get on your phone, surf's up, cesium's down, you know, that kind of information would be quite useful, right? <laughs> Uh, people want to know, and let's make it easier for them to do. Thank you very much.